Chapter 18 of the Andes and the Amazon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Andes and the Amazon by James Orton. Chapter 18. Tributaries and Tints. Volume and Current. Rise and Fall. Navigation. Expeditions on the Great River. Near the silver mines of Cerro Pasco, in the little lake of Lauricocha, just below the limit of perpetual winter, rises the King of Waters. For the first five hundred miles it flows northerly, in a continuous series of cataracts and rapids, through a deep valley between the parallel cordilleras of Peru. Upon reaching the frontier of Ecuador, it turns to the right, and runs easterly two thousand five hundred miles across the great equatorial plain of the continent. No other river flows in the same latitude, and retains, therefore, the same climatic conditions for so great a distance. The breadth of the Amazon, also, is well proportioned to its extraordinary length. At Tabachinga, two thousand miles above its mouth, it is a mile and a half wide. At the entrance of the Madeira, it is three miles. Below Santarém, it is ten. And if the Pará be considered a part of the great river, it fronts the Atlantic one hundred and eighty miles. Brazilians proudly call it the Mediterranean of the New World. Its vast expanse, presenting below Tefé magnificent reaches with blank horizons, and forming a barrier between different species of animals, its system of back channels joining the tributaries and linking a series of lagoons too many ever to be named, its network of navigable waters stretching over one-third of the continent, its oceanic fauna, porpoises and manatees, gulls and frigate birds, remind the traveler of a great inland sea with endless ramifications, rather than a river. The side channels through the forest, called by the Indians igarapés, or canoe paths, are one of the characteristic features of the Amazon. They often run to a great distance parallel to the great river, and intersecting the tributaries, so that one can go from Santarém a thousand miles up the Amazon without once entering it. These natural highways will be of immense advantage for intercommunication. But extraordinary as is this network of natural canals, the tributaries of the Amazon are still more wonderful. They are so numerous, they appear on the map like a thousand ribbons streaming from a mainmast, and many of the obscure affluents, though large as the Hudson, are unknown to geography. From three degrees north, to twenty degrees south, every river that flows down the eastern slope of the Andes is a contributor, as though all the rivers between Mexico and Mount Hooker united their waters in the Mississippi. While the great river of the northern continent drains an area of one million two hundred thousand square miles, the Amazon, not including the Tocantins, is spread over a million more or over a surface equal to two-thirds of all Europe. Let us journey around the grand trunk, and take a glimpse of the main branches. The first we meet in going up the left bank is the Rio Negro. It rises in the Sierra Tunuhi, an isolated mountain group in the Llanos of Colombia, and enters the Amazon at Manaus, a thousand miles from the sea. The upper part, down to the parallel of one degree north, has a very rapid current. At San Gabriel are the first rapids in ascending. Between San Gabriel and Barcellos, the rate is not over two or three miles per hour. Between Barcellos and Manaus, it is a deep but sluggish river, and in the annual rise of the Amazon, its waters are stagnant for several hundred miles up, or actually flow back. Its extreme length is 1,200 miles, and its greatest breadth is at Barcellos, where it is 12 or 15 miles. Excepting this middle section, the usual breadth of the Negro below the equatorial line is about one mile. It is joined to the Orinoco by the navigable Casiquiari, 
a natural canal three-fourths of a mile wide, and a portage of only two hours divides the head of its tributary, the Branco, from the Esequibo of Guiana. The Negro yields to commerce coffee, cacao, farina, sarsaparilla, Brazil nuts, pitch, piaçaba, and valuable woods. The commerce of Brazil with Venezuela by the Rio Negro amounted in 1867 to $22,000, of which 9,000 was the value of imports. The principal villages above Manaus are San Miguel and Moroa, which contain about 50 dwellings each, Chireguin, Barceios, Toma, San Carlos, Juana, San Gabriel, and Santa Isabel. The next great affluent is the Japurá. It rises in the mountains of New Granada, and flowing southeasterly a thousand miles, enters the Amazon opposite Ega, 500 miles above Manaus. Its principal mouth is 300 feet wide, but it has a host of distributing channels, the extremes of which are 200 miles apart. Its current is only three quarters of a mile an hour, and it has been ascended by canoes 500 miles. A natural canal, like the Caciquiari, is said to connect it with the Orinoco. The products of the Japurá are Sarsaparilla, Copaíba, rubber, cacao, farina, brazil nuts, moirapiranga, a hard, fine-grained wood of a rich, cherry-red color, and carajuru, a brilliant scarlet dye. Parallel to the Japurá is the Putumayo, or Issa. Its source is the Lake of San Pablo, at the foot of the volcano of Pasto. Its mouth, as given by Herndon, is half a mile broad, and its current, two and three-fourths miles an hour. Farther west are the Napo and Pastassa, starting from the volcanoes of Quito. The former is nearly 700 miles long, navigable 500. The latter is an unnavigable torrent. One of its branches, the Topo, is one continued rapid. Of those who have fallen into it, only one has come out alive. Another, the Patate, rises near Ilimisa, runs through the plain to a little south of Cotopaxi, receives all streams flowing from the eastern side of the western cordillera from Iliniza to Chimborazo, and unites near Tunguragua with the Chambo, which rises near Sangai. Castelnó and Bates saw pumice floating on the Amazon. It was probably brought from Cotopaxi by the Pastaça. Crossing the Maranhon and going eastward, we first passed the Hualaga, a rapid river of the size of the Cumberland, coming down the Peruvian Andes from an altitude of 8,600 feet and entering the great river nearly opposite the Pastaça. Its mouth is a mile wide, and for a hundred miles up, its average depth is three fathoms. In July, August, and September, the steamers are not able to ascend to Yurimaguas. Canoe navigation begins at Tinga Maria, 300 miles from Lima. The fertile plain through which the river flows is attractive to an agriculturist. Cotton is gathered six months after sowing, and rice in five months. At Tarapoto, a large amount of cotton cloth is woven for export. The next great tributary from the south is the Ucayali. This magnificent stream originates near ancient Cusco, and has a fall of 0.87 of a foot per mile, and a length nearly equal to that of the Negro. For 250 miles above its mouth, it averages half a mile in width, and has a current of three miles an hour. At Sarayacu, it is 20 feet deep. The Ucayali is navigable for at least 700 miles. The Morona, a steamer of 500 tons, has been up to the entrance of the Pachitea in the dry season, a distance of 600 miles, and in the wet season ascended that branch to Mairo. A small Peruvian steamer has recently ascended the Tambo to within 60 miles of Fort Ramon, or 773 miles from Nauta. Leaving the Ucayali, we pass by six rivers rising in the unknown lands of northern Bolivia, the Javari, navigable by steam for 250 miles, the sluggish Jutai, half a mile broad and 400 miles long, the Juruá, four times the size of our Connecticut, and navigable nearly its entire length, the unhealthy, 
little known Tefé and Quari, and the Purus, a deep, slow river, over a thousand miles long, and open to navigation halfway to its source. Soldan and Pinto claim to have ascended the Javari in a steamer about one thousand miles, and it is said Chandlers went up the Purus one thousand eight hundred miles. The Tefé is narrow, with a strong current. Of all these six rivers, the Purus is the most important. It is probably the Amaru Mayu, or Serpent River, of the Incas, and its affluents enjoy the privilege of draining the waters of those beautiful Andes which form the eastern boundary of the empire of Manco Capac, and fertilizing the romantic valley of Paucar Tambu, or Inn of the Flowery Meadow. The banks of this noble stream are now held by the untamable chunchos, but the steam whistle will accomplish what the rifle cannot. The Purus communicates with the Madeira, proving the absence of rapids and of intervening mountains. Sixty miles below the confluence of the Negro, the mighty Madeira, the largest tributary of the Amazon, blends its milky waters with the turbid king of rivers. It is about two thousand miles in length. One branch, the Beni, rising near Lake Titicaca, drains the fertile valleys of Yungus and Apollo, rich in chinchona, chocolate, and gold. The Mahmore springs from the vicinity of Chuquisaca, within fifteen miles of a source of the Paraguay, traversing the territory of the brave and intelligent Moshus, while the Ichines washes down the golden diamonds of Mato Grosso. Were it not for the Cascade, four hundred and eighty miles from its mouth, large vessels might sail from the Amazon into the very heart of Bolivia. When full, it has a three-mile current, and at its junction with the Amazon, it is two miles wide and sixty-six feet deep. Five hundred miles from its mouth, it is a mile wide and one hundred feet deep. It contains numerous islands, and runs in a comparatively straight course. It received its name from the vast quantity of driftwood often seen floating down. The value of Brazilian commerce with Bolivia by the Madeira was, in 1867, $43,000. At Santarém, the Amazon receives another great tributary, the Tapajós, or Rio Preto, as the Portuguese call it, a thousand miles long, and for the last eighty miles, from four to twelve miles in breadth. It rises amid the glittering mines of Mato Grosso, only twenty miles from the headwaters of the Rio Plata, and flows rapidly down through a magnificent hilly country to the last cataract, which is one hundred and sixty miles above Santarém, and is the end of navigation to sailing vessels. Thanks to the Amazon, it has little current and no great depth. From Santarém to Diamantino, it is about twenty-six days' travel. Large quantities of sarsaparilla, rubber, tonka beans, mandioca, and guaraná are brought down this river. Parallel to the Tapajós, and about two hundred miles distant, flows the Xingu. It rises in the heart of the empire, has the length of the Ohio and Monongahela, and can be navigated one hundred and fifty miles. This is the last great tributary of the Amazon proper. If, however, we consider the Pará as only one of the outlets of the great river, we may then add to the list the Grand Tocantins. This splendid river has its source in the rich province of Minas, the source also of the São Francisco and Uruguay, not 600 miles from Rio de Janeiro, a region possessing the finest climate in Brazil and yielding diamonds and rubies, the sapphire, topaz and opal, gold, silver and petroleum. The Tocantins is 1,600 miles long and 10 miles broad at its mouth, but unfortunately, rapids commence 120 miles above Cametá. The Araguaia, its main branch, is, according to Castle No, one mile wide, with a current of three-fourths of a mile an hour. Here are six tributaries, all of them superior to any river in Europe outside of Russia, save the Danube, and ten times greater than any stream on the west slope of the Andes. While the Arkansas joins the Mississippi 400 miles above New Orleans, 
the Madeira of equal length, enters the Amazon 900 miles from Pará. But, vast as are these tributary streams, they seem to make no impression on the Amazon. They are lost, like brooks in the ocean. Our ideas of the magnitude of the great river are wonderfully increased when we see the Madeira coming down 2,000 miles, yet its enormous contribution imperceptible halfway across the giant river, or the dark waters of the Negro creeping along the shore and becoming undistinguishable five miles from its mouth. Though the Amazon carries a larger amount of sediment than any other river, it has no true delta, the archipelago in its mouth, for, like our own St. Lawrence, it has its bay of a thousand isles, not being an alluvial formation, but having a rocky base. The great island of Marajó, in physical configuration, resembles the mainland of Guiana. The deltoid outlet is confined to the tributaries, nearly all of them, like the disemboining Nile, emptying themselves by innumerable embouchures. To several tributaries, the Amazon gives water before it receives their tribute. Thus, by ascending the Negro sixty miles, we have the singular spectacle of water pouring in from the Amazon through the Guariba Channel. The waters of this great river system are of diverse tints. The Amazon, as it leaps from the Andes, and as far down as the Ucayali, is blue, passing into a clear olive green. Likewise, the Pastaça, Huayaga, Tapajós, Xingu, and Tocantins. Below the Ucayali, it is of a pale, yellowish olive. The Madeira, Purush, Juruá, Jutaí, Javari, Ucayali, Napu, Isá, and Japurá are of similar color. The Negro, Quari, and Tefé are black. Humboldt observes that a cooler atmosphere, fewer mosquitoes, greater salubrity, and absence of crocodiles, as also of fish, mark the region of these black rivers. This is not altogether true. The Amazon throughout is healthy, being swept by the trade winds. The branches, which are not so constantly refreshed by the ocean breezes, are occasionally malarious. The white water tributaries, except when they have a slack current in the dry season, have the best reputation, while intermittent fevers are nearly confined to the dark-colored streams. Much of the sickness on these tropical waters, however, is due to exposure and want of proper food, rather than to the climate. The river system of South America will favorably compare, in point of salubrity, with the river system of its continental neighbor. As we might expect, the volume of the Amazon is beyond all parallel. Half a million cubic feet of water pour through the narrows of Obidus every second, and fresh water may be taken up from the Atlantic far out of sight of land. The fall of the main easterly trunk of the Amazon is about six and a half inches per mile, equivalent to a slope of twenty-one minutes, the same as that of the Nile, and one-third that of the Mississippi. Below Jaén, there are thirty cataracts and rapids. At the Pongo de Manseriche, at the altitude of 1,164 feet, according to Humboldt, it bids adieu to mountain scenery. Between Tabachinga and the ocean, the average current is three miles an hour. It diminishes toward Pará, and is everywhere at a minimum in the dry season, but it always has the swing of an ocean current. Though not so rapid as the Mississippi, the Amazon is deeper. There are seven fathoms of water at Nauta, 2,200 miles from the Atlantic, 11 at Stabachinga, and 27 on the average below Manaus. The Amazon and its branches are subject to an annual rise of great regularity. It does not take place simultaneously over the whole river, but there is a succession of freshets. At the foot of the Andes, the rise commences in January. At Ega, it begins about the end of February. Coinciding with this contribution from the West, the October rains on the highlands of Bolivia and Brazil swell the southern tributaries, whose accumulated floods reach the mainstream in February. In the latter, 
unable to discharge the avalanche of waters, inundates a vast area, and even crowds up the northern tributaries. As the Madeira, Tapajós, and Purus subside, the Negro, fed by the spring rains in Guiana and Venezuela, presses downward till the central stream rolls back the now sluggish affluence from the south. There is, therefore, a rhythmical correspondence in the rise and fall of the arms of the Amazon, so that this great freshwater sea sways alternately north and south, while the onward swell in the grand trunk is a progressive undulation eastward. As the Cambridge professor well says, in this oceanic river the tidal action has an annual instead of a daily ebb and flow. It obeys a larger orb, and is ruled by the sun and not the moon. As the southern affluents have the greatest volume, the Amazon receives its largest accession after the sun has been in the southern hemisphere. The rise is gradual, increasing to one foot per day. One lowland after another sinks beneath the flood. The forest stands up to its middle in the water, and shady dells are transformed into navigable creeks. Swarms of turtles leave the river for the inland lakes. Flocks of wading birds migrate to the banks of the Negro and Orinoco to enjoy the cloudless sky of the dry season. Alligators swim where a short time before the jaguar lay in wait for the tapir, and the natives, unable to fish, huddle in their villages to spend the winter of their discontent. The lower Amazon is at its minimum in September or October. The rise above this lowest level is between seven and eight fathoms. If we consider the average width of the Amazon two miles, we shall have a surface of at least five thousand square miles raised fifty feet by the inundation. An extraordinary freshet is expected every sixth year. The Atlantic tide is perceptible at Obidus, 450 miles above Pará, and Bates observed it up the Tapajós, 530 miles distant. The tide, however, does not flow up. There is only a rising and falling of the waters, the momentary check of the great river in its conflict with the ocean. The bore, or piroroco, is a colossal wave at springtide, rising suddenly along the whole width of the Amazon to a height of 12 or 15 feet, and then collapsing with a frightful roar. The Amazon presents an unparalleled extent of water communication. So many and far-reaching are its tributaries, it touches every country on the continent, except Chile and Patagonia. South America is well-nigh quartered by its river system. The Amazon starts within 60 miles of the Pacific. The Tapajós and Madeira reach down to the La Plata, while the Negro mingles its waters with those of the Orinoco. The tributaries also communicate with each other by intersecting canals, so numerous that central Amazonia is truly a cluster of islands. Wagons and railroads will be out of the question for ages hence in this aquatic basin. No other river runs in so deep a channel to so great a distance. For two thousand miles from its mouth there are not less than seven fathoms of water. Not a fall interrupts navigation on the main stream for 2,500 miles, and it so happens that, while the current is ever east, for even the ocean cannot send up its tide against it, there is a constant trade wind westward, so that navigation up or down has always something in its favor. As a general rule, the breeze is not so strong during the rise of the river. There are at least 6,000 miles of navigation for large vessels. It was lately said that the Mississippi carries more vessels in a month and the Yangtze Kiang in a day than the Amazon all the year round. But this is no longer true. Steamers already ascend regularly to the port of Moyabamba, which is less than 20 days' travel from the Pacific coast. The Amazon was opened to the world September the 7th, 1867, and the time cannot be far distant when the exhaustless wealth of the great valley, its timber, fruit, medicinal plants, gums, and dyestuffs, will be emptied by this great highway into the commercial lap of the Atlantic, when crowded steamers will plow all these waters, yellow, black, and blue, and the sloths and alligators, monkeys and jaguars, 
toucans and turtles will have a bad time of it. Officially free to the world, the great river is, however, for the present, practically closed to foreign shipping, as it is difficult to compete with the Brazilian steamers. For, by the contract which lasts till 1877, the company is allowed an annual subsidy of four million dollars, which has since been increased by 250 mil reis per voyage. In 1867, the steamers and sailing vessels on the Amazon were divided as follows, though it must be remembered that few of the foreign ships, except in Portuguese, ascended beyond Pará. Nationality, United States, number 37, tonnage, 39,901 and a half. Brazil, 49, tonnage, 28,639. England, 52, 13,276 and a half. Portugal, 24, 7,871. France, 18, 5,344. Prussia, 4, 889 and a half. Holland, 3, 538. Denmark, 2, 525. Holstein, 3, 498. Norway, 1, 135. Spain, 1, 90. The vessels carrying the stars and stripes exported from Pará to the value of 3,235,073 mil reis 950, or eight times the amount carried by Brazilian craft, and 50,000 mil reis more than England. While, therefore, the Imperial Company has the monopoly of trade on the Amazon, our ships distribute one-third of the products to the world. The United States is the natural commercial partner with Brazil, for not only is New York the halfway house between Pará and Liverpool, but a chip thrown into the sea at the mouth of the Amazon will float close by Cape Hatteras. The official value of exports from Pará in 1867 was 9,926,912 reis 557, or above 5 millions of dollars, an increase of 1 million over 1866. The early expeditions into the valley of the Amazon in search of the Gilded King are the most romantic episodes in the history of Spanish discovery. To the wild wanderings of these worshippers of gold succeeded the more earnest explorations of the Jesuits, those pioneers of geographical knowledge. Pinzon discovered the mouth of the river in 1500, but Orellana, who came down the Napo in 1541, was the first to navigate its waters. Twenty years later, Aguirre descended from Cusco. In 1637, Teixeira ascended to Quito by the Napo. Cabrera descended from Peru in 1639. Juan de Palacios by the Napo in 1725. La Condamine from Jaén in 1744. And Madame Godin by the Pastaza in 1769. The principal travelers who preceded us in crossing the continent this century were Maw in 1828, Pepig in 1831, Smith in 1834, Von Schudi in 1845, Castelnau in 1846, Herndon and Gibbon in 1851, and Mark Hoy 1867, who came down through Peru, and a Spanish commission, Almagro, Spada, Martinez, and Iser, who made the Napo transit in 1865. To Spicks and Marshes, 1820, Bates and Wallace, 1848 to 1857, Azevedo and Pinto, 1862 and 1864, and Agassi, 1865, the world is indebted for the most scientific surveys of the river in Brazil. Such is the Amazon, the mightiest river in the world, rising amid the loftiest volcanoes on the globe, and flowing through a forest unparalleled in extent. It only once wrote Father Acuna, in order to surpass the Ganges, Euphrates, and the Nile in felicity, that its source should be in paradise. As if one name were not sufficient for its grandeur, it has three appellations, Maranhon, Solimões, and Amazon. The first applied to the part in Peru, the second to the portion between Tabachinga and Manaus, 
and the third to all below the Rio Negro. We have no proper conception of the vast dimensions of the thousand-armed river till we sail for weeks over its broad bosom, beholding it sweeping disdainfully by the great Madeira, as if its contribution was of no account, discharging into the sea one hundred thousand cubic feet of water per second more than our Mississippi, rolling its turbid waves thousands of miles, exactly as it pleases, plowing a new channel every year, with tributaries twenty miles wide, and an island in its mouth, twice the size of Massachusetts. End of chapter 18《Chapter 19 of the Andes and the Amazon》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Andes and the Amazon》by James Orton《Chapter 19 The Valley of the Amazon — Its Physical Geography — Geology — Climate — Vegetation from the Atlantic shore to the foot of the Andes, and from the Orinoco to the Paraguay, stretches the great valley of the Amazon. In this vast area, the United States might be packed without touching its boundaries. It could contain the basins of the Mississippi, the Danube, the Nile, and the Huang Ho. It is girt on three sides by a wall of mountains. On the north are the highlands of Guiana and Venezuela. On the west stand the Andes. On the south rise the tablelands of Mato Grosso. The valley begins at such an altitude that on the western edge vegetation differs as much from the vegetation at Pará, though in the same latitude, as the flora of Canada from the flora of the West Indies. The greater part of the region drained by the Amazon, however, is not a valley proper, but an extensive plain. From the mouth of the Napo to the ocean, a distance of eighteen hundred miles in a straight line. The slope is one foot in five miles. At Coca, on the Napo, the altitude is eight hundred fifty feet, according to our observations. At Tinga Maria, on the Hualaga, it is two thousand two hundred, according to Herndon. At the junction of the Negro with the Casiquiari, it is four hundred, according to Wallace. At the mouth of the Marmore, it is eight hundred, according to Gibbon. At the Pongo de Manceriche, below all rapids, it is 1,160, according to Humboldt. And at the junction of Araguaia with the Tocantins, it is 200, according to Castelnau. These barometrical measurements represent the basin of the Amazon as a shallow trough lying parallel to the equator, the southern side having double the inclination of the northern, and the whole gently sloping eastward. Furthermore, the channel of the great river is not in the center of the basin, but lies to the north of it. Thus, the hills of Almeirin rise directly from the river, while the first falls on the Tocantins, Xingu, and Tapajós are nearly two hundred miles above their mouths. The rapids of São Gabriel, on the Negro, are one hundred and seventy-five miles from the Amazon, while the first obstruction to the navigation of the Madeira is a hundred miles farther from the great river. Of the creation of this valley we have already spoken. No region on the face of the globe of equal extent has such a monotonous geology. Around the rim of the basin are the outcroppings of a Cretaceous deposit. This rests on the hidden Mesozoic and Paleozoic strata which forms the ribs of the Andes. Above it, covering the whole basin from New Granada to the Argentine Republic, are the following formations. First, a stratified accumulation of sand. Second, a series of laminated clays of diverse colors, without a pebble. Third, a fine, compact sandstone. Fourth, a coarse, porous sandstone, so ferruginous as to resemble bog iron ore. This last was, originally, a thousand feet in thickness, but was worn down, perhaps, in some sudden escape of the pent-up waters of the valley. The table-topped hills of Almeirin are almost the sole relics. Finally, 
over the undulating surface of the denuded sandstone an ochraceous, unstratified sandy clay was deposited. It is a question to what period this great accumulation is to be assigned. Humboldt called it Old Red Sandstone. Marshes pronounced it New Red. Agassiz says Drift, the glacial deposit brought down from the Andes and worked over by the melting of the ice which transported it. The professor father declares that these deposits are fresh water deposits. They show no sign of a marine origin. No seashells nor remains of any marine animal have as yet been found throughout their whole extent. Tertiary deposits have never been observed in any part of the Amazonian basin. This was true up to 1876. Neither Bates, Wallace, nor Agassiz found any marine fossil on the banks of the great river. But there is danger in building a theory on negative evidence. These explorers ascended no farther than Tabachinga. Two hundred miles west of that fort is the little Peruvian village of Pebas, at the confluence of the Ambiacu. We came down the Napo and Marañón, and stopped at this place. Here we discovered a fossiliferous bed, intercalated between the variegated clays so peculiar to the Amazon. It was crowded with marine tertiary shells. This was Pebas versus Cambridge. It was unmistakable proof that the formation was not drift, but tertiary, not of fresh, but salt water origin. The species, as determined by W. M. Gabb, Esquire of Philadelphia, are Neritina pupa, Turbonilla minuscula, Esalia ortoni, Telina amazonensis, Pachydon obliqua, and P. tenua. All of these are new forms, excepting the first, and the last is a new genus. It is a singular fact that the Neritina is now living in the West India waters, and the species found at Pebas retains its peculiar markings. So that we have some ground for the supposition that not many years ago there was a connection between the Caribbean Sea and the Upper Amazon. In other words, that Guiana has only very lately ceased to be an island. There is no mountain range on the watershed between the Orinoco and the Negro and Japurá, but the three rivers are linked by natural canals. Interstratified with the clay deposit are seams of a highly bituminous lignite. We traced it from near the mouth of the Curarai on the Rio Napo to Loreto on the Marañón, a distance of about 400 miles. It occurs also at Iquitos. This is farther testimony against the glacial theory of the formation of the Amazonian valley. The paucity of shells in such a vast deposit is not astonishing. It is as remarkable in the similar accumulation of reddish argillaceous earth called Pampian mud, which overspreads the Rio Plata region. Some of the pampa shells, like those at Pebas, are proper to brackish water and occur only on the highest banks. The Pampian formation is believed by Mr. Darwin to be an estuary or delta deposit. We will mention in this connection that silicified wood is found at the headwaters of the Napo. The Indians use it instead of flint, which does not occur there, in striking a light. Darwin found silicified trees on the same slope of the Andes as the Uspalata Pass. The climatology of the valley of the Amazon is as simple as its physical geography. There is no circle of the seasons as with us. Nature moves in a straight line. The daily order of the weather is uniform for months. There is very little difference between the dry and hot seasons. The former, lasting from July to December, is varied with showers, and the latter, from January to June, with sunny days while the daily temperature is the same within two or three degrees throughout the year. On the watershed between the Orinoco and Negro, it rains throughout the year, but most water falls between May and November, the coolest season in that region. On the middle Negro, the wet season extends from June 1st to December 1st and is the most sultry time. Comparatively few insects, birds or beasts are to be seen in summer, but it is the harvest time of the inhabitants 
who spent the glorious weather rambling over the playas and beaches, fishing and turtle hunting. The middle of September is the midsummer of the valley. The rainy season, or winter, is ushered in by violent thunderstorms from the west. It is then that the woods are eloquent with buzzing insects, shrill cicadas, screaming parrots, chattering monkeys, and roaring jaguars. The greatest activity of animal and vegetable life is in June and July. The heaviest rains fall in April, May, and June. Scarcely ever is there a continuous rain for 24 hours. Castelnau witnessed at Pebas a fall of not less than 30 inches in a single storm. The greatest amount noticed in New York during the whole month of September was 12.2 inches. The humidity of the atmosphere, as likewise the luxuriance of vegetation and the abundance and beauty of animal forms, increases from the Atlantic to the Andes. At the foot of the Andes, Pepig found that the most refined sugar in a few days dissolved into syrup, and the best gunpowder became liquid even when enclosed in canisters. So we found the Napo steaming with vapor. Fogs, however, are rarely seen on the Amazon. The animals and plants are not all simultaneously affected by the change of seasons. The trees retain their verdure through the dry veron and have no set time for renewing their foliage. There are a few trees, like Mongruba, which drop their leaves at particular seasons, but they are so few in number they create the impression of a few dead leaves in a thick growing forest. Leaves are falling and flowers drooping all the year round. Each species, and in some cases, each individual has its own particular autumn and spring. There is no hibernation nor estivation, except by land shells. Birds have not one uniform time for nidification, and molting extends from February to May. Amazonia, though equatorially situated, has a temperate climate. It is cooler than Guinea or Guiana. This is owing to the constant evaporation from so much submerged land and the ceaseless trade winds. The mean annual temperature of the year is about 81 degrees. The nights are always cool. There are no sudden changes and no fiery dog days. Venereal and cutaneous affections are found among the people, but they spring from an irregular life. A traveler on the slow black tributaries may take the Tertiana, but only after weeks of exposure. Yellow fever and cholera seldom ascend the river above Pará, and on the middle Amazon there are neither endemics nor epidemics, though the trades are feebly felt there, and the air is stagnant and sultry. According to Bates, swampy and weedy places on the Amazon are generally more healthy than dry ones. Whatever exceptions be taken to the branches, the main river is certainly as healthy as the Mississippi, the rapid current of the water and the continual movement of the air maintaining its celebrity. The few English residents, Mrs. Hislop, Jeffreys, and Hawkswell, who have lived here thirty or forty years, are as fresh and florid as if they had never left their native country. The native women preserve their beauty until late in life. Great is the contrast between the gloomy winters and dusty summers, the chilly springs and frosty autumns of the temperate zone, and the perennial beauty of the equator. No traveler on the Amazon would exchange what Wallace calls the magic half-hour after sunset for the long gray twilight of the north. The man accustomed to this climate, wrote Herndon, is ever unwilling to give it up for a more bracing one. The mineral kingdom is represented only by sand, clay, and loam. The solid rock, except the sandstone already mentioned, begins above the falls on the tributaries. The precious gems and metals are confined to the still higher lands of Goiás, Mato Grosso, and the slopes of the Andes. The soil on the lower Amazon is sandy. On the Solimões and Maranhon, it is a stiff loam or vegetable mold, in many places twenty feet deep. Both in botany and zoology, South America is a natural and strongly marked division, quite as distinct from North America as from the Old World. And, as there are no transverse barriers, there is a remarkable unity in the character of the vegetation. 
no spot on the globe contains so much vegetable matter as the valley of the amazon from the grassy steppes of venezuela to the treeless pampas of buenos aires expands a sea of verdure in which we may draw a circle of eleven hundred miles in diameter which shall include an evergreen unbroken forest there is a most bewildering diversity of grand and beautiful trees a wild unconquered race of vegetable giants draped festooned corded matted and ribboned with climbing and creeping plants woody and succulent in endless variety the exuberance of nature displayed in these million square acres of tangled impenetrable forest offers a bar to civilization nearly as great as its sterility in the african deserts a macheta is a necessary predecessor the moment you land and it is often difficult to get a footing on the bank you are confronted by a wall of vegetation light lianas starred with flowers coil up the stately trees and then hang down like strung jewels they can be counted only by myriads yet they are mere superfluities the dense dome of green overhead is supported by crowded columns often branchless for eighty feet the reckless competition among both small and great adds to the solemnity and gloom of a tropical forest individual struggles with individual and species with species to monopolize the air light and soil in the effort to spread their roots some of the weaker sort unable to find a footing climb a powerful neighbor and let their roots dangle in the air while many a full-grown tree has been lifted up as it were in the strife and now stands on the ends of its stilt-like roots so that a man may walk upright between the roots and under the trunk the mass of the forest on the banks of the great river is composed of palms about thirty species leguminous or pod-bearing trees colossal nut trees broad-leaved musacea or bananas and giant grasses the most prominent palms are the architectural pupunya or peach palm with spiny stems drooping deep green leaves and bunches of mealy nutritious fruit the slender acai with a graceful head of delicate green plumes the ubusu with mammoth undivided fronds the stiff serrated leaved busu and gigantic mirichi one of the noblest trees of the forest is the masaranduba or cow tree proximum galactodendron often rising one hundred and fifty feet it is a hard fine-grained durable timber and has a red bark and leathery fig-like foliage the milk has the consistency of cream and may be used for tea coffee or custards it hardens by exposure so as to resemble gutta percha another interesting tree and one which yields the chief article of export is the caucho or india rubber tree siphonia brasiliensis growing in the lowlands of the amazon for eighteen hundred miles above para it has an erect tall trunk from forty to eighty feet high a smooth gray bark and thick glossy leaves the milk resembles thick yellow cream and is colored by a dense smoke obtained by burning palm nuts it is gathered between august and december a man can collect six pounds a day though this is rarely done it is frequently adulterated with sand the tree belongs to the same epitalis family as our castor oil and the mandioca while the tree which furnishes the kachuk of the east indies and africa is a species of ficus and yields an inferior article to the rubber of america other characteristic trees are the mongruba one of the few which shed their foliage before the new leaf buds expand the giant samauma or silk cotton tree called huimba in peru the calabash or cuyeira whose gourd-like fruit furnishes the cups used throughout the amazon the itauba or stonewood furnishing ship timber as durable as teak the red and white cedar used for canoes not coniferous like the northern evergreen but allied to the mahogany the jacarandá or rosewood resembling our locust palo de sangre one of the most valuable woods on the river huacapu a very common timber capirona 
used as fuel on the steamers, and tawari, a heavy, close-grained wood, the bark of which splits into thin leaves, much used in making cigarettes. The piaçaba, a palm yielding a fiber extensively manufactured into cables and ropes, and exported to foreign countries for brushes and brooms, being singularly elastic, strong, and more durable than hemp, and the moira pinima, or tortoise shell wood, the most beautiful wood in all Amazonia, if not in the world, grow up on the upper Rio Negro. A small willow represents the great catkin family. The valley is as remarkable for the abundance, variety, and value of its timber as for anything else. Within an area of half a mile square, Agassi counted 117 different kinds of woods, many of them eminently fitted by their hardness, tints, and beautiful grain for the finest cabinet work. Enough palo de sangre or moira pinima is doubtless wasted annually to veneer all the palaces of Europe. While most of our fruits belong to the rose family, those of the Amazon come from the myrtle tribe. The delicious flavor for which our fruits are indebted to centuries of cultivation is wanting in many of the torrid productions. We prefer the sweetness of Pomona in temperate climes to her savage beauty in the sunny south. It is a curious fact, noticed by Herndon, that nearly all the valuable fruits of the valley are enclosed in hard shells or acid pulps. They also reach a larger size in advancing westward. The common Brazil nut is the product of one of the tallest trees in the forest, Bertoletia excelsa. The fruit is a hard, round shell, resembling a common ball, which contains from twenty to twenty-four nuts. Eighteen months are required for the bud to reach maturity. This tree, says Humboldt, offers the most remarkable example of high organic development. Akin to it is the sapucaia, or chicken's nuts, the citi sapucaia, whose capsule has a natural lid and is called monkey's drinking cup. The nuts, about a dozen in number, are of irregular shape and much richer than the preceding. But they do not find their way to market because they drop out of the capsule as soon as ripe and are devoured by peccaries and monkeys. The most luscious fruit of the Amazon is the Ada of Santarem. It has the color, taste, and size of the Chirimoya, but the rind, which encloses a rich, custardly pulp, frosted with sugar, is scaled. Next in rank are the melting pineapples of Pará and the golden papayas, fully equal to those on the western coast. This is the original home of the cacao. It grows abundantly in the forests of the upper river, and particularly on the banks of the Madeira. The wild nut is smaller but more oily than the cultivated. The Amazon is destined to supply the world with the bulk of chocolate. The aromatic tonka beans, cumaru, used in flavoring snuff, and the Brazilian nutmegs, puxiri, inferior to the Ceylon, grow on lofty trees on the Negro and lower Amazon. The Guaraná beans are the seeds of a trailing plant. From these the Mao has prepared the great medicine on the Amazon for diarrhea and intermittent fevers. Its active principle, caffeine, is more abundant than in any other substance, amounting to 5.07%, while black tea contains only 2.13. Coffee, rice, tobacco, and sugar cane are grown to a limited extent. Rio Negro coffee, if put into the market, would probably eclipse that of Ceará, the best Brazilian. Wild rice grows abundantly on the banks of the rivers and lakes. The cultivated grain is said to yield fortyfold. Most of the tobacco comes down from the Maranhon and Madeira. It is put up in slender rolls from three to six feet long, tapering at each end, and wound with palm fiber. The sugar cane is an exotic from southeastern Asia, but grows well. The first sugar made in the New World was by the Dutch in the island of St. Thomas in 1610. Farinha is the principal farinaceous production of Brazil. The mandioca, or cassava, money hot utilissima, from which it is made, is supposed to be indigenous, though it is not found wild. It does not grow at a higher altitude than 2,000 feet. Life and death are blended in the plant, 
yet every part is useful. The cattle eat the leaves and stalks, while the roots are ground into pole, which, when pressed and baked, forms farinha, the bread of all classes. The juice is a deadly poison. Thirty-five drops were sufficient to kill, in six minutes, a negro convicted of murder. But it deposits a fine sediment of pure starch that is the well-known tapioca, and the juice, when fermented and boiled, forms a drink. On the upper waters grow the celebrated coca, a shrub with small, light green leaves, having a bitter, aromatic taste. The powdered leaves mixed with lime form ipadu. This is to Peruvians what opium is to the Turk, betel to the Malay, and tobacco to the Yankee. Thirty million pounds are annually consumed in South America. It is not, however, an opiate, but a powerful stimulant. With it, the Indian will perform prodigies of labor, traveling days without fatigue or food. Fonchudi considers its moderate consumption wholesome, and instances the fact that one coca chewer attained the good old age of 130 years, but when used to excess it leads to idiocy. The signs of intemperance are an uncertain step, sallow complexion, black-rimmed, deeply sunken eyes, trembling lips, incoherent speech, and stolid apathy. Coca played an important part in the religious rites of the Incas, and divine honors were paid to it. Even today the miners of Peru throw a quid of coca against the hard veins of ore, affirming that it renders them more easily worked, and the Indians sometimes put coca in the mouth of the dead to ensure them a welcome in the other world. The alkaloid, cocaine, was discovered by Vela. Flowers are nearly confined to the edges of the dense forest, the banks of the rivers and lagoons. There are a greater number of species under the equator, but we have brighter colors in the temperate zone. There is grandeur and sublimity in the tropical forest, wrote Wallace after four years of observation, but little of beauty or brilliancy of color. Perhaps the finest example of inflorescence in the world is seen in the Victoria Regia, the magnificent water lily discovered by Schoenberg in 1837. It inhabits the tranquil waters of the shallow lakes which border the Amazon. The leaves are from 15 to 18 feet in circumference and will bear up a child 12 years old. The upper part is dark, glossy green, the underside violet or crimson. The flowers are a foot in diameter, at first pure white, passing in 24 hours through successive hues from rose to bright red. This queen of water plants was dedicated to the queen whose empire is never at once shrouded in night. End of chapter 19。Chapter 20 of the Andes and the Amazon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Andes and the Amazon by James Orton. Chapter 20. Life within the Great River. Fishes. Alligators, turtles, tortoises, and manatees. The Amazon is a crowded aquarium, holding representatives of every zoological class, infusoria, hydras, fresh water shells, chiefly ampullaria, melania, and unias, aquatic beetles, belonging mostly to new genera, fishes, reptiles, water birds, and cetaceans. The abundance and variety of fishes are extraordinary, so also are the species. This great river is a peculiar ichthyc province, and each part has its characteristics. According to Agassi, the whole river, as well as its tributaries, is broken up into numerous distinct fauna. The pirarucu, or redfish, the sudis gigas of science, is at once the largest, most common, and most useful fish. The Peruvian Indians call it paixi. It is a powerful fish, often measuring eight feet in length and five in girth, clad in an ornamental coat of mail, its large scales being marginated with bright red. It ranges from Peru to Pará. 
it is usually taken by the arrow or spear. Salted and dried, the meat will keep for a year, and forms, with farinha, the staple food on the Amazon. The hard, rough tongue is used as a grater. Other fishes most frequently seen are the prettily spotted catfish, pescada, piranha, acará, which carries its young in its mouth, and the long, slender needle fish. There are ganoids in the river, but no sturgeons proper. Pickerel, perch, and trout are also wanting. The stingray represents the shark family. As a whole, the fishes of the Amazon have a marine character, peculiarly their own. The reptilian inhabitants of this inland sea are introduced by numerous batrachians, water snakes, heliops, and anacondas. But alligators bear the palm for ugliness, size, and strength. In summer, the main river swarms with them. In the wet season, they retreat to the interior lakes and flooded forests. It was for this reason that we did not see an alligator on the Napo. At low water, they are found above the entrance of the Curarai. About Obidos, where many of the pools dry up in the fine months, the alligator buries itself in the mud and sleeps till the rainy season returns. It is scarcely exaggerating to say, writes Bates, that the waters of the Solimões are as well stocked with large alligators in the dry season as a ditch in England is in summer with tadpoles. There are three or four species in the Amazon. The largest, the jacaré wassu of the natives, attains a length of twenty feet. The jacaré chinga is a smaller kind, only five feet long when full grown, and has the long, slender muzzle of the extinct Teleosaurus. The South American alligators are smaller than the crocodiles of the Nile or Ganges, and they are also inferior in rank. The head of the jacaré wassu the ordinary species, is broad, while the gavial of India has a long, narrow muzzle, and that of the Egyptian lizard is oblong. The dentition differs, while in the old-world saurian the teeth interlock, so that the two jaws are brought close together, the teeth in the upper jaw of the Amazonian caiman pass by the lower series outside of them. The latter has, therefore, much less power. It has a ventral cuirass, as well as dorsal, and it is web-footed, while the crocodile has the toes free, another mark of inferiority. Sluggish on land, the alligator is very agile in its element. It never attacks men when on his guard, but it is cunning enough to know when it may do this with safety. It lays its eggs, about twenty, some distance from the river bank, covering them with leaves and sticks. They are larger than those of Guayaquil, or about four inches long, of an elliptical shape, with a rough, calcareous shell. Negro vendors sell them cooked in the streets of Pará. Turtles are, perhaps, the most important product of the Amazon, not excepting the pirarucu. The largest and most abundant species is the tartaruga grande, it measures, when full-grown, nearly three feet in length and two in breadth, and has an oval, smooth, dark-colored shell. Every house has a little pond, called Kuhu, in the backyard, to hold a stock of turtles through the wet season. It furnishes the best meat on the upper Amazon. We found it very tender, palatable, and wholesome, but baits who was obliged to live on it for years, says it is very cloying. Every part of the creature is turned to account. The entrails are made into soup. Sausages are made of the stomach. Steaks are cut from the breast, and the rest is roasted in the shell. The turtle lays its eggs, generally between midnight and dawn, on the central and highest part of the playas, or about a hundred feet from the shore. The Indians say, it will lay only where itself was hatched out. With its hind flippers, it digs a hole two or three feet deep and deposits from eighty to one hundred and sixty eggs, 
Gibbon says from 150 to 200. These are covered with sand, and the next comer makes another deposit on the top, and so on until the pit is full. Egg laying comes earlier on the Amazon than on the Napo, taking place in August and September. The Tracajá, a smaller species, lays in July and August. Its eggs are smaller and oval, but richer than those of the great turtles. The mammoth tortoise of the Galapagos lays an egg very similar in size and shape to that of the tartaruga, but a month later, or in October. The hunting of turtle eggs is a great business on the Amazon. They are used chiefly in manufacturing oil, manteca, for illumination. Thrown into a canoe, they are broken and beaten up by human feet. Water is then poured in, and the floating oil is skimmed off, purified over the fire in copper kettles, and finally put up in three-gallon earthen jars for the market. The turtles are caught for the table as they return to the river after laying their eggs. To secure them, it suffices to turn them over on their backs. The turtles certainly have a hard time of it. The alligators and large fishes swallow the young ones by hundreds. Jaguars pounce upon the full-grown specimens as they crawl over the playas, and vultures and ibises attend the feast. But man is their most formidable foe. The destruction of turtle life is incredible. It is calculated that fifty millions of eggs are annually destroyed. Thousands of those that escape capture in the egg period are collected as soon as hatched and devoured, the remains of yolk in their entrails being considered a great delicacy. An unknown number of full-grown turtles are eaten by the natives on the banks of the Maranon and Solimões and their tributaries, while every steamer, schooner, and little craft that descends the Amazon is laden with turtles for the tables of Manaus, Santarém, and Pará. When we consider also that all the mature turtles taken are females, we wonder that the race is not well-nigh extinct. They are, in fact, rapidly decreasing in numbers. A large turtle, which twenty years ago could be bought for fifty cents, now commands three dollars. One would suppose that the males, being unmolested, would far outnumber the other sex, but Bates says they are immensely less numerous than the females. The male turtles, or capitaris, are distinguishable by their much smaller size, more circular shape, and the greater length and thickness of their tails. Near the Tapajós, we meet a third species, called Matamata. It has a deeply keeled carapax, beautifully bossed, and a hideous triangular head, having curious, lobed, fleshy appendages, and nostrils prolonged into a tube. It is supposed to have great virtues as a remedy for rheumatism. But the most noticeable feature of the Amazonian fauna, as Agassi has remarked, is the abundance of cetaceans through its whole extent. From the brackish estuary of Pará to the clear, cool waters at the base of the Andes, these clumsy refugees from the ocean may be seen gambling and blowing as in their native element. Four different kinds of porpoises have been seen. The black species lives in the Bay of Marajó. In the middle Amazon are two distinct porpoises, one flesh-colored, and in the upper tributaries is the Inia boliviensis, resembling, but specifically different, from the sea dolphin and the susu of the Ganges. It was several years, says the naturalist on the Amazon, before I could induce a fisherman to harpoon dolphins, butos, for me as specimens, for no one ever kills these animals voluntarily. The superstitious people believe that blindness would result from the use of the oil in lamps. The herbivorous manatee, already mentioned in chapter 15, is found throughout the great river. It differs slightly from the Atlantic species. It rarely measures over twelve feet in length. It is taken by the harpoon or nets of Chambiri twine. Both Herndon and Gibbon mention seals as occurring in the Peruvian tributaries, but we saw none, 
neither did Bates, Agassiz, or Edwards. They probably meant the manatee. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of the Andes and the Amazon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Andes and the Amazon by James Orton. Chapter Twenty One. The forest of the Amazon is less full of life than the river. Beasts, birds, and reptiles are exceedingly scarce. Still there is, in fact, a great variety, but they are widely scattered and very shy. In the animal, as in the vegetable kingdom, diversity is the law. There is a great paucity of individuals compared with the species. Insects are rare in the dense forest. They are almost confined to the more open country along the banks of the rivers. Ants are perhaps the most numerous. There is one species over an inch long but the most prominent, by their immense numbers, are the dreaded saúvas. Well-beaten paths branch off in every direction through the forest, on which broad columns may be seen marching to and fro, each bearing vertically a circular piece of leaf. Unfortunately, they prefer cultivated trees, especially the coffee and orange. They are also given to plundering provisions. In a single night, they will carry off bushels of farinha. They are of a light red color with powerful jaws. In every formicarium, or ant colony, there are three sets of individuals, males, females, and workers. But the saubas have the singularity of possessing three classes of workers. The light-colored mounds often met in the forest, sometimes measuring forty feet in diameter by two feet in height, are the domes which overlie the entrances to the vast subterranean galleries of the saúba ants. These ants are eaten by the Rio Negro Indians and esteemed a luxury, while the Tapajós tribes use them to season their mandioca sauce. Akin to the vegetable-feeding saúbas are the carnivorous acetans, or foraging ants, of which Bates found ten distinct species. They hunt for prey in large organized armies, almost every species having its own special manner of marching and hunting. Fortunately, the Essetans choose the thickest part of the forest. The fire ant is the great plague on the Tapajós. It is small and of a shiny reddish color, but its sting is very painful, and it disputes every fragment of food with the inhabitants. All eatables and hammocks have to be hung by cords smeared with copaiba balsam. The traveler on the Amazon frequently meets with conical hillocks of compact earth from three to five feet high, from which radiate narrow covered galleries or arcades. The architects of these wonderful structures are the termites, or white ants, so called though they belong to a higher order of insects, widely differing from the true ants. The only thing in common is the principle of division of labor. The termite neuters are subdivided into two classes, soldiers and workers, both wingless and blind. Their great enemy is the ant-eater, but it is a singular fact, noticed by Bates, that the soldiers only attach themselves to the long, worm-like tongue of this animal, so that the workers on whom the prosperity of the termitarium depends, are saved by the self-sacrifice of the fighting caste. The office of the termites in the tropics seems to be to hasten the decomposition of decaying vegetation, but they also work their way into houses, trunks, wardrobes, and libraries. It is principally owing to their destructiveness, wrote Humboldt, that it is so rare to find papers in tropical America older than fifty or sixty years. Dragonflies are conspicuous specimens of insect life on the Amazon. The largest and most brilliant kinds are found by the shady brooks and creeks in the recesses of the forest, some of them with green or crimson bodies, seven inches long, and their elegant, lace-like wings tipped with white or yellow. Still more noticeable are the butterflies, there is a vast number of genera and species, 
and great beauty of dress, unequaled in the temperate zone. Some idea of the diversity is conveyed by the fact mentioned by Mr. Bates that about 700 species are found within an hour's walk of Pará, and 550 at Ega, while the total number found in the British islands does not exceed 66, and the whole of Europe supports only 300. After a shower in the dry season, the butterflies appear in fluttering clouds, for they live in societies, white, yellow, red, green, purple, black, and blue, many of them bordered with metallic lines and spots of a silvery or golden luster. The sulfur-yellow and orange-colored kinds predominate. A colossal morpho, seven and a half inches in expense, and visible a quarter of a mile off, frequents the shady glades. Splendid swallow-tailed papilios, green, rose, or velvety black, are seen only in the thickets, while the Hetaira esmeralda, with transparent wings, having one spot of a violet hue as it flies over the dead leaves in the dense forest, looks like a wandering petal of a flower. Very abundant is the Heliconius, which plays such an important figure, by its variations, in Wallace's theory of the origin of species. On the Maranon we found Calidia seubule, a yellow butterfly common in Florida. The most brilliant butterflies are found on the middle Amazon, out of reach of the strong trade winds. The males far outnumber the other sex, are more richly colored, and generally lead a sunshiny life. The females are of dull hues, and spend their lives in the gloomy shadows of the forest. Caterpillars and nocturnal moths are rare. There are no true hive bees, apides, in South America, but instead there are about 150 species of bees, mostly social moliponas, smaller than the European, stingless, and constructing oblong cells. Their colonies are much larger than those of the honeybee. The trigona occurs on the napo. Unlike the melipona, it is not confined to the new world. A large sooty black bombus represents our humblebee. Shrill cicadas, bloodthirsty mantucas, piums, punkies, and mosquitoes are always associated in the traveler's memory with the glorious river. Of the last, there are several kinds. The forest mosquito belongs to a different species from that of the town, being much larger and having transparent wings. It is a little cloud that one carries about his person every step on a woodland ramble, and their hum is so loud that it prevents one hearing well the notes of birds. The town mosquito has opaque, speckled wings, a less severe sting, and a silent way of going to work. The inhabitants ought to be thankful the big, noisy fellows never come out of the forest. Bates 2, 386. There are a few mosquitoes below Ega. Above that point, a mosquito net is indispensable. Beetles abound, particularly in shady places, and are of all sizes, from that of a pin's head to several inches in length. The most noticeable are the gigantic megalosoma and enema, armed with horns. Very few are carnivorous. This is the more remarkable, observes Darwin, when compared to the case of carnivorous quadrupeds, which are so abundant in hot countries. Very few are terrestrial, even the carnivorous species being found clinging to branches and leaves. In going from the pole to the equator, we find that insect life increases in the same proportion as vegetable life. There is not a single beetle on Melville Island. Eleven species are found in Greenland. In England, 2,500. In Brazil, 8,000. Here lives the king of spiders, the Migale Blondii, a monstrous hairy fellow, five inches long, of a brown color, with yellowish lines along its stout legs. Its abode is a slanting subterranean gallery, about two feet in length, the sides of which are beautifully lined with silk. Other spiders barricade the walks in the forest with invisible threads. 
some build nests in the trees and attack birds others again spin a closely woven web resembling fine muslin under the thatched roofs of the houses of land vertebrates lizards are the first to attract the attention of the traveler of the equator great in number and variety they are met everywhere crawling up the walls of buildings scampering over the hot dusty roads gliding through the forest they stand up on their legs carry their tails cocked up in the air and run with the activity of a warm-blooded animal it is almost impossible to catch them some of them are far from being the unpleasant-looking animals many people imagine but in their coats of many colors green gray brown and yellow they may be pronounced beautiful others however have a repulsive aspect and are a yard in length the iguana peculiar to the new world tropics is covered with minute green scales handed with brown though it changes its color like the chameleon and has a serrated back and guller pouch it grows to the length of five feet and is arboreal its white flesh and its oblong oily eggs are considered great delicacies we heard of a lady who kept one as a pet frogs and toads the chief musicians in the amazonian forest are of all sizes from an inch to a foot in diameter the bufo gigas is of a dull gray color and is covered with warts tree frogs gila are very abundant they do not occur on the andes or on the pacific coast their quack quack drum drum hoo hoo is one of our pleasant memories of south america of snakes there is no lack and yet they are not so numerous as imagination would make them there are one hundred and fifty species in south america or one half as many on the same area as in the east indies the diabolical family is led by the boa while the rear is brought up by the amphisbenas or double-headed snakes which progress equally well with either end forward so that it is difficult to make head or tail of them the majority are harmless the deadly corral is found on both sides of the andes and wherever there is a cacao plantation one of the most beautiful specimens of the venomous kind is a new species elaps imperator cob, which we discovered on the marañon it has a slender body more than two feet in length with black and red bands margined with yellow and a black and yellow head with permanently erect fangs we have already mentioned the most common birds probably says wallace no country in the world contains a greater variety of birds than the amazonian valley but the number does not equal the expectations of the traveller he may ramble a whole day without meeting one the rarity however is more apparent than real we forget for the moment the vastness of their dwelling place the birds of the country moreover are gregarious so that a locality may be deserted and silent at one time and swarming with them at another parrots and toucans are the most characteristic groups to the former belong true parrots parakeets and macaws the first are rarely seen walking but are rapid flyers and expert climbers on the trees they are social as monkeys but in flight they always go in pairs the parakeets go in flocks the hesithine macau the araruna of the natives is one of the finest and rarest species of the parrot family it is found only on the south side of the amazon the macau was considered sacred by the maya indians of yucatan and dedicated to the sun the quichuans call it guacamayo guaca meaning sacred of toucans there are many species the largest is the toco with a beak shaped like a banana the most beautiful are the curb crested or boharnet toucans and the p flowy rostris whose breast is adorned with broad belts of red crimson and black wherefore such a beak every naturalist has asked but the toucan still wags his head as much as to say you cannot tell there must be some other reason than adaptation 
birds of the same habits are found beside it the ibis pigeon spoonbill and toucan are seen feeding together how astonishing are the freaks and fancies of nature wrote the funny sydney smith to what purpose we say is a bird placed in the woods of cayenne with a bill a yard long making a noise like a puppy dog and laying eggs in hollow trees the toucan to be sure might retort to what purpose are certain foolish prating members of parliament created pestering the house of commons with their ignorance and folly and impeding the business of the country there is no end to such questions so we will not enter into the metaphysics of the toucan on the flooded islands of the negro and upper amazon is found the rare and curious umbrella bird black as a crow and decorated with a crest of hairy plumes and a long lobe suspended from the neck covered with glossy blue feathers this latter appendage is connected with the vocal organs and assists the bird in producing its deep loud and lengthy fluty note there are three species another rare bird is the uruponga or campanero in english the tolling bell bird found only on the borders of guiana it is of the size of our jay of a pure white color with a black tubercle on the upper side of the bill orpheus himself says waterton would drop his lute to listen to him so sweet so novel and romantic is the tall of the pretty snow-white campanero the campanero may be heard three miles echoes sydney smith this single little bird being more powerful than the belfry of a cathedral ringing for a new dean it is impossible to contradict a gentleman who has been in the forests of cayenne but we are determined as soon as a campanero is brought to england to make him tall in a public place and have the distance measured but the most remarkable songster of the amazonian forest is the healejo or organ bird its notes are as musical as the flagelle it is the only songster says bates which makes any impression on the natives besides those are the jacamars peculiar to equatorial america stupid but of the most beautiful golden bronze and steel colors sulky trogons with glossy green backs and rose-colored breasts long-toed jacanas half water half fowl the rich velvety purple and black humphocoelus jacapa having an immense range from archidona to pará the gallinaceous yet arboreal ciganas scarlet ibises smaller but more beautiful than their sacred cousins of the nile stilted flamingos whose awkwardness is atoned for by their brilliant red plumage glossy black mutuns or curaçao turkeys ghostly storks white egrets ash-colored herons black ducks barbets kingfishers sandpipers gulls plovers woodpeckers orioles tanagers essentially a south american family and excepting three or four species found only east of the andes wagtails finches thrushes doves and hummers the last by western indians living sunbeams named are few and not to be compared with the swarms in the andean valleys the birds of the amazon have no uniform time for breeding the majority however build their nests between september and new years and rarely lay more than two eggs amazonia like australia is poor in terrestrial mammals and the species are of small size nearly the only game a hunter can depend upon for food besides toucans and macaws is peccary one species of tapir to represent the elephants and rhinoceroses of the old world three small species of deer taking the places of deer antelopes buffaloes sheep and goats of the other continent three species of large felidae one peccary and a wild dog with opossums ant-eaters armadillos sloths squirrels the only rodents which approach ours capybaras pacas agoutis and monkeys comprise all the quadrupeds of equatorial america the last two are the most numerous marsupial rats take the place of the insectivorous mammals of ant-eaters there are at least four distinct species 
but they are scattered sparingly and are seldom found on the low flooded lands four or five species of armadillo inhabit the valley these little nocturnal burrowing edentates are the puny representatives of the gigantic glyptodon of pleistocene times and the sloths are the dwindling shadows of the lordly megatherium there are two species of three-toed sloths one inhabiting the swampy lowlands the other confined to the terra firma land they lead a lonely life never in groups harmless and frugal as a hermit they have four stomachs but not the long intestines of ruminating animals they feed chiefly on the leaves of the trumpet tree cecropia resembling our horse chestnut the natives both indian and brazilian hold the common opinion that the sloth is the type of laziness the capybara or homsoco the largest of living rodents is quite common on the riverside it is gregarious and amphibious and resembles a mammoth guinea pig pacas and aguchis are most abundant in the lowlands and are nocturnal these semi-hoofed rodents like the toxidon of old approach the pachyderms the tapir or grand bestia as it is called is a characteristic quadruped of south america it is a clumsy looking animal with a tough hide of an iron-gray collar covered with a coat of short coarse hair its flesh is dry but very palatable it has a less powerful proboscis than the malay species m roulin distinguishes another species from the mountains which more nearly resembles the asiatic the taper like the condor for an unknown reason is not found north of eight degrees north though it wanders as far south as forty degrees we met but one species of peccary the white-lipped d labiatus it is much larger than the mexican hog and too thick-headed to understand danger is a formidable antagonist the haposa is seen only on the middle amazon and very rarely there it has a long tapering muzzle small ears bushy tail and grayish hair it takes to the water for the one we saw at tabachinga was caught while crossing the amazon fawn-colored pumas spotted jaguars black tigers tiger cats all members of the graceful feline family inhabit all parts of the valley but are seldom seen the puma or panther is more common on the pacific side of the andes the jaguar is the fiercest and most powerful animal in south america it is marked like the leopard roses of black spots on a yellowish ground but they are angular instead of rounded and have a central dot there are also several black streaks across the breast which easily distinguish it from its transatlantic representative it is also longer than the leopard indeed humboldt says he saw a jaguar whose length surpassed that of any of the tigers of india which he had seen in the collections of europe the jaguar frequents the borders of the rivers and lagoons and its common prey is the capybara it fears the peccary the night air is alive with bats of many species the most prominent one being the disopes perotis, which measures two feet from tip to tip of the wings. If these chiropters are as impish as they look, and as bloodthirsty as some travelers report, it is singular that Bates and Waterton, though residing for years in the country, and ourselves, though sleeping for months unprotected, were unmolested. About forty species of monkeys or one half of the new world forms inhabit the valley of the amazon wallace in a residence of four years saw twenty-one species seven with prehensile and fourteen with non-prehensile tails they all differ from the apes of the other hemisphere while those of africa and asia europe has only one have opposable thumbs on the forefeet as well as hind uniformly ten molar teeth in each jaw as in men and generally cheek pouches and naked callosities the american monkeys are destitute of the two latter characteristics none of them are terrestrial like the baboon all save the marmosets have twenty-four molars 
the thumbs of the four hands are not habitually opposed to the fingers one genus atelis the imperfect is thumbless altogether the nostrils open on the sides of the nose instead of beneath it as in the gorilla and the majority have long prehensile tails they are inferior in rank to the anthropoids of the old world though superior to the lemurs of madagascar they are usually grouped in two families marmosets and sibiger the former are restless timid squirrel-like lilliputs one species is only seven inches long with tails not prehensile in the case of the scarlet-faced nearly wanting the barigudos or gluttons lagothrix are the largest of american monkeys but are not so tall as the quaitas they are found west of manaus they have more human features than the other monkeys and with their woolly gray fur resemble an old negro there are three kinds of howlers misetes the red or mono colorado of humboldt the black and the m beelzebub found only near para the forest is full of these surly untamable guaribas as the natives call them they are gifted with a voice of tremendous power and volume with which they make night and day hideous they represent the baboons of the old world in disposition and facial angle thirty degrees and the gibbons in their yells and gregarious habits the sapajus cebus are distributed throughout brazil and have the reputation of being the most mischievous monkeys in the country on the west coast of south america there are at least three or four species of monkeys among them a black howler and a cebus capucinus the coitas or spider monkeys are the highest of american cradrumana they are slender-legged sluggish and thumbless with a most perfectly prehensile tail terminating in a naked palm which answers for a fifth hand the indians say they walk under the limbs like the sloth they are the most common pets in brazil but they refuse to breed in captivity both coitas and barigudos are much persecuted for their flesh which is highly esteemed by the indians mr bates has called our attention to the arboreal character of a large share of the animals in the amazonian forest all the monkeys and bats are climbers and live in the trees nearly all the carnivores are feline and are therefore tree mounters though they lead a terrestrial life the plantigrade circolaptes has a long tail and is entirely arboreal of the edentates the sloth can do nothing on the ground the gallinaceous birds as the cigana and curaçao the pheasant and turkey of the amazon perch on the trees while the great number of arboreal frogs and beetles is an additional proof of the adaptation of the fauna to a forest region even the epiphytous plants sitting on the branches suggest this arboreal feature in animal life End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of the andes and the amazon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the andes and the amazon by james orton chapter twenty two we come now to the genus homo man makes a very insignificant figure in the vast solitudes of the amazon between manaus and para the most densely peopled part of the valley there is only one man to every four square miles and the native race takes a low place in the scale of humanity as the western continent is geologically more primitive than the eastern and as the brute creation is also inferior in rank so the american man in point of progress seems to stand in the rear of the old world races both the geology and duology of the continent were arrested in their development vegetable life alone has been favored the aboriginal american wrote von martius is at once in the incapacity of infancy and unpliancy of old age he unites the opposite poles of intellectual life we will not touch the debatable ground of the red man's origin 
nor inquire whether he is the last remains of a people once high in civilization. But we are tempted to express the full belief that tropical America is not his center of creation. He is not the true child of the tropics, and he lives as a stranger, far less fitted for its climate than the Negro or Caucasian. Yet a little while, and the race will be as extinct as the dodo. He has not the supple organization of the European, enabling him to accommodate himself to diverse conditions. Among the Andean tribes, there are seldom over five children, generally but one in a family. And Bates, speaking of Brazilian Indians, says, Their fecundity is of a low degree, and it is very rare to find a family having so many as four children. While it is probable that Mexico was peopled from the north, it is very certain that the Tupi and Guarani, the long-headed hordes that occupied eastern South America, came up from the south, moving from the Paraguay to the banks of the Orinoco. From the Tupi nation, perhaps a branch of the Guarani, sprung the multitudinous tribes now dwelling in the vast valley of the Amazon. In such a country, unbroken by a mountain, uniform in climate, we need not look for great diversity. The general characters are these, skin of a brown color, with yellowish tinge, often nearly the tint of mahogany, thick, straight black hair, black horizontal eyes, low forehead, somewhat compensated by its breadth, beardless, of the middle height but thick set, broad, muscular chest, small hands and feet, incurious, unambitious, impassive, undemonstrative, with a dull imagination and little superstition, with no definite idea of a supreme being, few tribes having a name for God, though one for the demon, with no belief in a future state, and accepting civility with virtues all negative. The semi-civilized along the lower Amazon, called Tupuyus, seem to have lost, in the language of Wallace, the good qualities of savage life, and gained only the vices of civilization. There are several hundred different tribes in Amazonia, each having a different language. Even the scattered members of the same tribe cannot understand each other. This segregation of dialects is due, in great part, to the inflexibility of Indian character, and has isolated a narrow round of thought and life. When and where the Babel existed, whence the many branches of the great Tupi family separated, we know not. We only know that though different in words, these languages have the same grammatical construction. In more than one respect, the polyglot American is antipodal to the Chinese. The language of the former is richest in words, that of the latter, the poorest. The preposition follows the noun, and the verb ends the sentence. Ancient Tupi is the basis of the lingua geral, the intertribal tongue on the middle Amazon. The semi-civilized Chikunas, Mundurukus, etc., have one costume, the men in trousers and white cotton shirts, the women in calico petticoats, with short, loose chemises, and their hair held in a knot on the top of the head by a comb, usually of foreign make, but sometimes made of bamboo splinters. The wild tribes north and south go nearly or quite nude, while those on the western tributaries wear cotton or bark togas or ponchos. The habitations are generally a framework of poles, thatched with palm leaves, the walls sometimes latticed and plastered with mud, and the furniture chiefly hammocks and earthen vessels. The Mundurukus are the most numerous and warlike tribe in Amazonia. They inhabit both banks of the Tapajois, and can muster, it is said, two thousand fighting men. They are friendly to the whites, and industrious, selling to traders large quantities of farina, sarsaparilla, rubber, and tonka beans. Their houses are conical or quadrangular huts, sometimes open sheds, and generally contain many families. According to Wallace, the Mundurukus are the only perfectly tattooed nation in South America. 
It takes at least ten years to complete the tattooing of the whole person. The skin is pricked with spines, and then the soot from burning pitch rubbed in. Their neighbors, the Pararawaches, are intractable, wandering savages, roaming through the forest and sleeping in hammocks slung to the trees. They have delicately formed hands and feet, an oval face, and glistening black eyes. On the west side of the Tapajós, near Vila Nova, are the Mauhés, an agricultural tribe, well-formed, and of a mild disposition. On the lower Madeira are the houseless, formidable Araras, who paint their chins red with achote, an addo, and usually have a black tattooed streak on each side of the face. They have long made the navigation of the great tributary hazardous. Above them dwell the Parentinchins, light-colored and finely featured, but nude and savage. In the labyrinth of lakes and channels at the mouth of the Madeira live the lazy, brutal Muras, the most degraded tribe on the Amazon. They have a darker skin than their neighbors, an extraordinary breadth of chest, muscular arms, short legs, protuberant abdomens, a thin beard, and a bold, restless expression. They pierce the lips and wear peccary tusks in them in time of war. The Indians on the Purush live generally on the communal principle and are unwarlike and indolent. The Purupurus bury in sandy beaches, go naked, and have one wife. On the great northwest tributary of the Rio Negro, the Wakayari, there are numerous tribes, collectively known as the Waupesh. They have permanent abodes, in shape of a parallelogram, with a semicircle at one end, and of a size to contain several families, sometimes a whole tribe. One of them, Wallace informs us, was 115 feet long by 75 broad and about 30 high. The walls are bulletproof. Partitions of palm leaves divide it into apartments for families, the chief occupying the semicircular end. The men alone wear clothes and ornaments, but both sexes paint their bodies with red, black, and yellow colors in regular patterns. The men have a little beard, which they pull out, as also the eyebrows, and allow the hair to grow unshorn, tying it behind with a cord and wearing a comb, while the women cut theirs and wear no comb. They are an agricultural people, peaceable, ingenious, apathetic, diffident, and bashful. The Catauixés inhabit the banks of the Tefé. They perforate the lips and wear rows of sticks in the holes. At the mouth of the Juruá, are the uncivilized but tall, noble-looking Marawash. They pierce the ears and lips and insert sticks. They live in separate families and have no common chief. Above them live the treacherous Arawash. On the opposite side of the Amazon are the nearly extinct Passeis and Juris, the finest tribes in Central America. They are peaceable and industrious and have always been friendly to the whites. The Passeis are a slenderly built, light-colored, dignified, superior race, distinguished by a large square tattooed patch in the middle of the face. The Juris tattoo in a circle round the mouth. Nearby are the Wainambeus, or hummingbirds, distinguished by a small blue mark on the upper lip. Higher up the Japura is the large cannibal tribe of Miranhas, living in isolated families and on the Tocantins dwell the low Caixanas, who kill their first-born children. Along the left bank of the Amazon, from Loreto to Japurá, are the scattered houses and villages of the Tucunas. This is an extensive tribe, leading a settled agricultural life, each horde having a chief and a medicine man, or priest of their superstitions. They are good-natured and ingenious, excelling most of the other tribes in the manufacture of pottery. But they are idle and debauched, naked except in the villages, and tattooed in numbers of short, straight lines on the face. The Marubus on the Javari have a dark complexion and a slight beard, and on the west side of the same river roam the Mageronas, fierce, hostile, light-colored, bearded cannibals. 
In the vicinity of Pebas dwell the inoffensive Yaguas. The shape of the head, but not their vacant expression, is well represented by Catlin's portrait of Black Hawk, a sock chief. They are quite free from the encumbrance of dress, the men wearing a girdle of fibrous bark around the loins, with bunches looking like a mop hanging down in front and rear, and similar bunches hung around the neck and arms. The women tie a strip of brown cotton cloth about the hips. They paint the whole body with a shotchin. They sometimes live in communities. One large structure with Gothic roof is used in common, on the inside of which, around the walls, are built family sleeping rooms. The Yaguas are given to drinking and dancing. They are said to bury their dead inside the house of the deceased and then set fire to it, but this conflicts with their communal life. Perhaps, with the other tribes on the Japurá, Isa, and Napo, they are fragments of the great Omagua nation, but the languages have no resemblance. Of the Oriente Indians we have already spoken. The tall, finely built Kukamas near Nauta are shrewd, hard-working, canoe men, notorious for the singular desire of acquiring property. And the Yameus, a white tribe, wander across the Maranon as far as Sarayaku. On the Ucayali are numerous vagabond tribes, living for the most part in their canoes and temporary huts. They are all lazy and faithless, using their wives, polygamy is common, as slaves. Infanticide is practiced, that is, deformed children they put out of the way, saying they belong to the devil. They worship nothing. They bury their dead in a canoe or earthen jar under the house, which is vacated forever, and throw away his property. The common costume is a long gown called kushma of closely twilled cotton, woven by the women. Their weapons are two-edged battle axes of hard wood, as palo de sangre, and bows and arrows. The arrows, five or six feet long, are made from the flower stalk of the arrow grass, cunerium, the head pointed with the flinty chonta and tipped with bone, often anointed with poison. At the base, two rows of feathers are sparely arranged, showing the Indian's knowledge of the rifle principle. When they have fixed abodes, several families live together under one roof, with no division separating the women, as among the Red Indians on the Pastasa. The roof is not over ten feet from the ground. The Piros are the highest tribe. They have but one wife. The Conibus are an agricultural people, yet cannibals, stretching from the upper Ucayali to the sources of the Perus. They are a fair-looking, athletic people, and, like the Shipibus, of tan wear a piece of money under the lip. The Campas are the most numerous and warlike. They are little known, as travelers give them a wide berth. Herndon fancy they were the descendants of the Inca race. They are said to be cannibals, and from the specimen we saw, we should judge them uncommonly sharp. He was averse to telling us anything about his tribe, but turned our questions with an equivocal repartee and a laugh. The Cachibus on the Pachitea is another cannibal tribe. They are light-colored and bearded. The dwarfish, filthy Himus, alone of the Ucayali Indians, tattoo, though not so perfectly as the Mundurucus, using black and blue colors. The other tribes simply paint. It was among these wild Indians on the Ucayali that the Franciscan friars labored so long and zealously, and with a success far greater and more lasting than that which attended any other missionary enterprise in the valley. The remaining inhabitants of the Amazon are mixed breeds, Negroes and whites. The amalgamations form the greater part of the population of the large towns. Von Schudi gives a catalogue of twenty-three hybrids in Peru, and there are undoubtedly as many or more in Brazil. The most common are Mamelucos, offspring of white with Indian, mulattoes from white and negro, Cafuzos or Zambus from Indian and negro, Curibocos from Cafuzo and Indian, and Shibarus from Cafuzo and negro. To define their characteristics correctly, 
says von Schudi, would be impossible, for their minds partake of the mixture of their blood. As a general rule, it may be said that they unite in themselves all the faults without any of the virtues of their progenitors. As men, they are generally inferior to the pure races, and as members of society, they are the worst class of citizens. Yet, they display considerable talent and enterprise, as in Quito, a proof that mental degeneracy does not necessarily result from the mixture of white with Indian blood. There is, however, confesses Bates, after ten years' experience, a considerable number of superlatively lazy, shrieky, and sensual characters among the half-castes, both in rural places and in the towns. Our observations do not support the opinion that the result of amalgamation is a vague compound, lacking character and expression. The moral part is perhaps deteriorated, but in tact and enterprise they often excel their progenitors. Negroes are to be seen only on the lower Amazon. By the new act of emancipation, such as our slaves, continue so, but their children are free. Negroes born in the country are called Creoles. Of the white population, save a handful of English, French, and German, the Portuguese immigrants are the most enterprising men on the river. They are willing to work, trade, or do anything to turn a penny. Those who acquire a fortune generally retire to Lisbon. The Brazilians proper are the descendants of the men who declare themselves free and independent of the mother country. Few of them are of pure Caucasian descent, for the immigration from Portugal for many years has been almost exclusively of the male sex. It is generally considered bad taste in Brazil to boast purity of descent. Bates 1, 241. Brazilians are stiff and formal, yet courteous and lively, communicative and hospitable, well-bred and intelligent. They are not ambitious, but content to live and enjoy what nature spontaneously offers. The most a Brazilian wants is farina and coffee, a hammock and a cigar. Brazilian ladies have led a dreary life of constraint and silence, without education or society, the husband making a nun of his wife after the old bigoted Portuguese notion. But during the last twenty years, the doors have opened. Brazil attained her independence in 1823, Brazilian women in 1848. Here, in this virgin valley, where every plant is an evergreen, possessing the most agreeable and enjoyable climate in the world, with a brilliant atmosphere, rivaled only by that of Quito, and with no changes of seasons, here we may locate the paradise of the lazy. Life may be maintained with as little labor as in the Garden of Eden. Perhaps no country in the world is capable of yielding so large a return for agriculture. Nature, evidently designing this land as the home of a great nation, has heaped up her bounties of every description. Fruits of richest flavors, woods of finest grain, dyes of gayest colors, and drugs of rarest virtues, and left no sirocco or earthquake to disturb its people. Providence, moreover, has given the present emperor a wise and understanding heart, and the government is a happy blending of imperial dignity and republican freedom. White, negro, half-caste, and Indian may be seen sitting side by side on the jury bench. Certainly, the nation cannot be a despicable one whose best men are able to work themselves up to positions of trust and influence. God bless the Empire of the South. End of chapter 22、Chapter、23 of the Andes and the Amazon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Andes and the Amazon by James Orton. Chapter 23. How to Travel in South America Routes, Expenses, Outfit, Precautions, Dangers 
The most vague and incorrect notions prevail in respect to traveling in South America. The sources of trustworthy and desirable information are very meager. Murray has not yet published a handbook for the Andes. Routes, methods, and expenses of travel are almost unknown. And the imagination depicts vampires and scorpions, tigers and anacondas, wild Indians and fevers without end, impassable rivers and inaccessible mountains as the portion of the tourist. The following statements, which can be depended upon, may therefore be acceptable to those who contemplate a trip on the Andes and the Amazon. The shortest, cheapest, most feasible, and least interesting route across the continent is from Valparaiso to Buenos Aires. The breadth of South America is here only 800 miles. By railroad, from Valparaiso to the foot of the Andes. Thence, a short mule ride by the Uspalata Pass, altitude 12,000 feet under the shadow of Aconcagua to Mendoza, thence by coach across the Pampas to the Rio Plata. The Portillo Pass, traversed by Darwin, is nearer, but more lofty and dangerous. Bolivia offers the difficult path of Gibbon, from the coast to Cochabamba, thence down the Marmoré and Madeira. There are three routes through Peru. First, from Lima to Mairo, by way of Cerro Pasco and Juanaco, by mule, ten days. Thence down the Pachitea, by canoe, six days. Thence down the Ucayali to Iquitos, by steamer, six days, forty-five hours running time. When the road from Lima to Mairo is finished, the passage will be shortened four days. No snow is met in crossing the Andes in summer, but in winter it is very deep. Second, Herndon's route, from Lima to Tinga Maria, by way of Huanaco, by mule, 15 days, distance 300 miles. The passage is difficult in the rainy season. Thence by canoe 15 days down the Huayaga to Yurimaguas. Third, and best, by mule from Trujillo to Cajimarca, 5 days. Note the magnificent ruins. Then to Chachapoyas, 7 days. Here are pre incarial relics. Thence to Moyabamba, eight days. Thence on foot to Balsa Puerto, four days. Thence by canoe to Yurimaguas, two days. Price of a mule from Trujillo to Moyabamba is $30. Canoe hire, $10. The Peruvian steamers arrive at Yurimaguas the fifth of every month and leave the seventh. Reach Nauta the ninth and Iquitos the tenth. Leave Iquitos the 16th and arrive at Tabachinga the 19th to connect with the Brazilian line. Going up, they leave Tabachinga the 21st and arrive at Iquitos the 24th, stopping six days. Running time from Yurimaguas to Tabachinga, 48 hours. Fare, $70 gold. Third class, $17. La Condamines route, via Loja and the Maranon, is difficult. And Madame Godin's via the pastaça is perilous on account of rapids and savages the transit by the napo we will now give in detail six hundred dollars in gold will be amply sufficient for a first-class passage from new york to new york across the continent of south america making no allowance for stoppages for necessary expenses in ecuador take a draft on london which will sell to advantage in guayaquil so will mexican dollars American gold should be taken for expenses on the Amazon in Brazil. At Pará, it commands a premium. On the Maranhão, it is below par. Peruvian gold should therefore be bought at Guayaquil for that part of the route. Also, French medios, or quarter francs. They will be very useful everywhere on the route, especially on the upper Amazon, where change is scarce. Fifty dollars worth will not be too many, for, as the Scotchman said of sixpences, they are canny little dogs, and often do the work of shillings. Take a passport for Brazil. Leave behind your delicacies and superfluities of clothing. Woolen clothes will be serviceable throughout. A trunk for mountain travel should not exceed 24 by 15 by 15 inches. Smaller, the better. Take a rubber air pillow and mattress. There's no bed between Guayaquil and Pará. A hammock for the Amazon can be bought on the Napo. 
The Pacific Mail steamships, which leave New York on the 1st and 16th of each month, connect at Panama without delay with the British steam navigation line on the South Pacific. Fare, first class, from New York to Guayaquil by way of Panama and Peta, $215 gold, second class $128. Time to Panama, 8 days, to Paita, 4 days, to Guayaquil, 1 day. A coasting steamer leaves Panama for Guayaquil the 13th of each month. There are two so-called hotels in Guayaquil. Los Tres Mosqueteros, kept by Senor Gonzalez, is the best. Take a front room, $1 per day, and board at the Fonda Italiana or La Santa Rosa, $1 per day. Here, complete your outfit for the mountains. Saddle with strong girth and crupper, saddle bags, saddle cover, sweat cloth, and brittle. For dollars, paper. Woolen poncho, $9. Rubber poncho, $4. Blanket, $6. Leggings, native spurs and syrups, knife, fork, spoon, teapot, chocolate. Tea, pure and cheap, should be purchased at Panama. Candles, matches, soap, towels, and tarpaulin for wrapping up baggage. Convert your draft into paper, quantum sufficit, for Guayaquil. The rest into silver. Besides this outer outfit, an inner one is needed, of patience without stint. You will soon learn that it is one thing to plan and quite another to execute. To get out of the inn is one half of the journey, is very appropriately a Spanish proverb. Spaniards do nothing d'apresado, in a hurry, but everything mañana, tomorrow. You will find fondas, horses, and roads divided into the bad, the worse, and the worst, and bad is the best. But fret not thyself. Serenity of mind, wrote Humboldt, almost the first requisite for an undertaking in inhospitable regions, passionate love for some class of scientific labor, and a pure feeling for the enjoyment which nature in her freedom is ready to impart, are elements which, when they meet together in an individual, ensure the attainment of valuable results from a great and important journey. The journey to Quito must be made between May and November. In the rainy season the roads are impassable. From Guayaquil to Bodegas by Yankee steamer, fare two dollars, time eight hours. At Bodegas hire beasts at the Consignacion for Guaranda, price for riding and cargo beasts for dollars each. No extras for the arriero. A mule will carry two hundred and fifty pounds. Buy bread at Bodegas and Guaranda. The Indians on the road are very loth to sell anything. Buy a fowl, therefore, at the first opportunity or you will have to live on dirty potato soup and be glad of that. At the tambos or wayside inns, you pay only for yerba, father. Never unsettle your beast till it is cool. An Indian will even leave the brittle on for a time. To Guaranda, three full days. There, take mules, safer than horses in climbing the mountains, for Quito. Six dollar twenty-five silver per beast. Time, five days. Be sure to leave Guaranda by four a.m., for in the afternoon Chimborazo is swept by furious winds. Also, start with a full stomach. You will get nothing for two days. Drink sparingly of the snow water which dashes down the mountains. You will be tempted to curse Chukipoyo, but thank heaven it is no worse. There are two hotels in Quito, French and American. The former has the better location, the latter the better rooms. Best front room furnished half a dollar a day cheaper by the month. Meals, too, 25 cents each. The beef is excellent, but the cuisine, oh, onions. God sends the meat and the evil one cooks. You can hire a professional male cook, Indian, for five dollars a month, but you can't teach him anything. Fish is not to be had in Quito. Gibbon speaks of having some in Cusco, but does not tell us where it came from. Price of best flour, three dollars sixty per quintal. Butter, 30 cents a pound. Beef, a dollar in aroba, 25 pounds. Refined sugar, 350 in aroba. Brown sugar, rapadura, 5 cents a pound. Cigars, from 6 to 16 for a dime. Cigarettes, 5 cents a hundred. Horse hire, from 50 cents to 1 dollar per day. If you are to remain some time, buy a beast. A good mule costs 40 dollars. An ordinary horse, 50 dollars. The post office department is a swindle. 
If you pay through, you will find on your arrival home that your letters have been paid at both ends. Ask our consul at Guayaquil to forward them. The necessary preparations for the Napo journey have been given in a previous chapter, chapter 11. We might add to the list a few cans of preserved milk from New York, for you will not see a drop between the Andes and the Atlantic. Fail not to take plenty of lienzo. You must have it to pay the Indians, and any surplus can be sold to advantage. A bale of thirty varas costs about fifty dollars. Rely not at all on game. A champion sharpshooter could not live by his rifle. Santa Rosa and Coca will be represented to you as small New Yorks, but you will do well if you can buy a chicken between them. From Quito to Papayacta, two days and a half. Riding beast, twelve dollars silver, and one dollar twenty for each cargo of three arobas. At Papayata, hire Indians for Archidona. Each carries three arobas and wants five dollars silver in advance. You take to your feet. Time, nine days, including one day of rest at Baeza. At Archidona, you take a new set of peons for Napo at twenty-five cents apiece. Time, one day. From Napo down the river to Santa Rosa, one day. You give two and a half varas of lienzo to each Indian, and the same for the canoe. From Santa Rosa to Pebas on the Maranon, fifteen days. Cost of an Indian, twenty-five varas. Ditto for a canoe. We advise you to stop at Coca and rig up a raft or craft of some kind. We ascribe our uninterrupted good health to the length and breadth of our accommodations. The Peruvian steamer from the west arrives at Pebas on the sixteenth of each month. Fare to Tabachinga, fifteen dollars gold. Time, four days. Running time, 11 hours. Brazilian steamer leaves Tabachinga the 20th of each month. Fare to Manaus, $44.44 gold. Time, 5 days. Distance, 1,000 miles. From Manaus to Pará, $55.55 gold. Time, 6 days. Distance, 1,000 miles. The Brazilian steamers make semi-monthly trips. We found two hotels in Pará. The Italiana, Dear and Poor, the Gianna, unpretending but comfortable. Charges at the latter for room and board two dollars a day. The best time for traveling on the Amazon is between July and December. The United States and Brazilian steamships on their homeward voyage call at Pará the seventh of each month. Fare to New York, a hundred fifty dollars gold, the same as down the whole length of the Amazon. Second class, seventy five dollars. Time, fourteen days. Distance by way of St. Thomas. 1,610 plus 1,400 miles. Steamer for Rio, the ninth of each month. Fare, $125. Time, 12 days. Distance, 2,190 miles. Fare from Rio to New York, $200. Fare by sailing vessel from Pará to New York, from $50 to $75. Time, 3 weeks. A British steamer from Rio stops at Pará and Lisbon. A word about health. First, take one grain of common sense daily. Do as the natives do. Keep out of the noonday sun and make haste slowly. Secondly, take with you quinine in two grain pills and begin to take them before leaving New York as the great African traveler Du Chaillou recommended us. As preventive against the intermittent fevers on the lowlands and rivers, Nothing is better than Dr. Copeland's celebrated pills. Quinine, 12 grains. Camphor, 12 grains. Cayenne pepper, 12 grains. Mix with mucilage and divide into 12 pills. Take one every night or morning as required. On the Amazon, carry Guarana. Woolen socks are recommended by those who have had much experience of tropical fevers. Never bathe when the air is moist. Avoid a chill. A native will not bathe till the sun is well up. Rub yourself with aguardiente, native rum, after a bath, and always when caught in a shower. Freely exercise in Quito to ward off liver complaints. Drink little water. Coffee or chocolate is better, and tea is best. Avoid spirits with fruit, and fruit after dinner. The sickliest time in Guayaquil is at the breaking up of the rainy season. As to dangers... First, from the people. Traveling is as safe in Ecuador as in New York, and safer than in Missouri. There are no Spanish banditti, though some places, as Chambo, near Riobamba, bear a bad name. 
it is not wise to tempt a penniless footpad by a show of gold, but no more so in Ecuador than anywhere. We have traveled from Guayaquil to Damascus, but have never had occasion to use a weapon in self-defense, and only once for offense, when we threatened to demolish an Arab sheik with an umbrella. Secondly, from brutes. Some travelers would have us infer that it is impossible to stir in South America without being affectionately entwined by a serpent, or sprung upon by a jaguar, or bitten by a rattlesnake, jiggers in every sand heap, and scorpions under every stone. The Edinburgh Review, 43-310. Padre Bernassa speaks of meeting a serpent two yards in diameter, but you will be disappointed at the paucity of animal life. We were two months on the Andes, August and September, before we saw a live snake. They are plentiful in the wet season in cacao plantations, but the majority are harmless. Dr. Russell, who particularly studied the reptiles of India, found that out of 43 species which he examined, not more than seven had poisonous fangs, and Sir E. Tennant, after a long residence in Ceylon, declare he had never heard of the death of an European by the bite of a snake. It is true, however, that the number and proportion of the venomous species are greater in South America than in any other part of the world, but it is some consolation to know that, zoologically, they are inferior in rank to the harmless ones, and certainly, at Sidney Smith, a snake that feels fourteen or fifteen stone stamping on his tail has little time for reflection, and may be allowed to be poisonous. If bitten, apply ammonia externally immediately, and take five drops in water internally. It is an almost certain antidote. The discomforts and dangers arising from the animal creation are no greater than one would meet in traveling overland from New York to New Orleans. Finally, of one thing the tourist in South America may be assured, that dear to him, as it is to us, will be the remembrance of those romantic rides over the cordilleras, amid the wild magnificence of nature, the adventurous walk through the primeval forest, the exciting canoe life on the Napo, and the long, monotonous sail on the waters of the great river. End of chapter 23chapter 24 of the andes and the amazon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the andes and the amazon by james orton chapter 24 in memoriam a life that all the muses decked with gifts of grace that might express all comprehensive tenderness all subtilizing intellect. Tennyson. On the east of the city of Quito is a beautiful and extensive plain, so level that it is literally a tableland. It is the classic ground of the astronomy of the 18th century. Here the French and Spanish academicians made their celebrated measurement of a meridian of the earth. As you stand on the edge of this plain, just without the city, you see the dazzling summit of Cayambi looking down from the north. On your left are the picturesque defiles of Pichincha. On your right, the slopes of Antisana. Close by you, standing between the city and the plain, is a high white wall enclosing a little plot, like the city above, four square. You are reminded by its shape, and also by its position relative to Quito and Pichincha, of that other sacred enclosure just outside the walls of Jerusalem and at the foot of Olivet, the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the Protestant cemetery. Through the efforts of our late representative, now also numbered with the dead, this place was assigned by the government for the interment of foreigners who do not die in the Romish faith. And there we buried our fellow traveler, Colonel Phineas Taunton, the artist of the expedition, and vice-chancellor of Ingham University, New York. On the 8th of September, 1867, we bore him through the streets of Quito to this quiet resting place, without parade and in solemn silence, just as we believe his unobtrusive spirit would have desired, and just as his Savior was carried from the cross to the sepulchre. 
no splendid hearse or nodding plumes, no long procession, save the unheard tread of the angels, no requiem, save the unheard harps of the seraphs. We gave him a Protestant Christian burial, such as Quito never saw. In this corner of nature's vast cathedral, the secluded shrine of grandeur and beauty not found in Westminster Abbey, we left him. We parted with him on the mount which is to be the scene of his transfiguration. It would be difficult for an artist to find a grave whose surroundings are so akin to his feelings. He lies in the lofty lap of the Andes, and snow-white pinnacles send around him on every side, just as we imagine the mountains are around the city of God. We think we hear him saying, as Fanny Campbell Butler said of another burial ground, I will not rise to trouble any one if they will let me sleep here. I will only ask to be permitted, once in a while, to raise my head and look out upon this glorious scene. No dark and dismal fogs gather at evening about that spot. It lies nearer to heaven than any other Protestant cemetery in the world. It is good, says Beecher, to have our mortal remains go upward for their burial and catch the earliest sounds of that trumpet which shall raise the dead. And the day is coming, when that precious vein of gold that now lies in the bosom of the mighty Andes shall leave its rocky bed and shine in sevenfold purity. Indeed, the artist is already in that higher studio among the mountains of Beola. A simple sculptured obelisk of sorrow stands over the dust of Colonel Staunton. His most fitting monument is his own life-work. He was the very painter Humboldt longed for in his writings. The artist, who studying nature's great hothouse, bounded by the tropics, should add a new and more magnificent kingdom of nature to art. Colonel Staunton, true and lovely in his own character, was ever seeking in nature for whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, and now was about to add whatsoever things are grand. He was a Christian artist, in sympathy with such men as Raphael and Leonardo da Vinci. The habitual choice of sacred subjects, says Ruskin, implies that the painter has a natural disposition to dwell on the highest thoughts of which humanity is capable. No shallow or false person could have conceived his ascension. Only the highest qualities of the intellect and heart, a soul already half ascended, could have given such ethereal lightness to those two men in white apparel. Only the pure in heart see God. As we revisit in imagination the spot where he sleeps so well, we behold, in the calm sublimity of the mountains that surround his grave, an image of the undisturbed repose of his spirit on the Rock of Ages. End of chapter 24 End of the Andes and the Amazon by James Orton